Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth installment of our speaker series, Identity and Belonging in a Global Age, sponsored by the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, and the Center on Modernity and Transition. I'm Benjamin Shul, co-director of the Center on Modernity and Transition. And I'm Shahrazad Sabet. I'm a fellow at the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU, and together with Ben, I direct the Center on Modernity and Transition. Questions of collective identity and belonging have surged to prominence in recent years. In this series, we bring together leading thinkers to examine the crises of identity that confront us and to think deeply about how humanity might resolve them in a rapidly changing global age. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Juliet Hooker and Samuel Moyne to discuss identity, liberalism, and democracy in America. Juliet Hooker is professor of political science at Brown University. She's the author of Race and the Politics of Solidarity, and also Theorizing Race in the Americas, Douglas Sarmiento, Du Bois, and Vasconcelos. Samuel Moyne is Henry R. Luce Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale Law School and Professor of History at Yale University. His books include The Last Utopia, Human Rights and History, and Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World. Juliet, Sam, a very warm welcome to you both. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So as um, Sam, you were part of our speaker series last year, we like to begin these conversations on a somewhat more intimate and biographical note. So to start, I'd like to ask each of you to tell us a bit about some of the personal intellectual pathways that led you to think and write about questions at the intersection of identity, liberalism, and democracy in America. Juliet, perhaps we can begin with you. Sure. So I'm originally from Latin America. So I think about these questions actually in terms of the Americas. And, um, you know, I came of age at a time when at the end of the 20th century, when Latin America was undergoing this process of, of democratization coming out of authoritarian um, uh, governments in the region. And so um, the question of what democ you know what democracy is, how to think about um, um, democracy in the context of racial um, and ethnic uh, diversity was very much on the table. And for me, these were questions that were urgent in terms of the the political context I was coming from. And then I went to graduate school. I came to the U.S and went to graduate school and I was drawn to um, political theory by studying feminism um, and feminist theory and in particular black feminism and the feminism of women of color. And so um, for me, there was a sense in which I guess you could say questions of identity and democracy were always intertwined. Um, and, in, and then when I started doing my dissertation research, um, I was drawn to, um, I thought I would be working on nationalism. And then I, um, I started to really think about the ways in which political theory theorists were thinking about the questions of justice posed by, um, by various forms of diversity. And as I looked at the multi, the literature, the theory, right, normative theories of multiculturalism, um, it was clear to me that the empirical examples were drawn primarily from Europe and North America, and that this was really driving the, um, the kinds of, um, the ways in which theoretical questions were being framed. And so I, I started to think about, but I also knew, right, that there was actually all of this, um, there was a significant amount of experimentation going on in Latin America with various forms of multicultural citizenship that weren't being integrated into those debates and political theory. And so that really was what drew me to trying to say, well, what happens if we try to think about what, what um, theories of multiculturalism should look like if we're starting from this different starting point? Thanks very much, Juliet. Sam, how about from your background into these uh, conversations and uh, questions? Well, to begin with, it's really nice to be part of it. Thanks for thanks for the invitation. I've been looking forward to, you know, learning from Juliet uh, and uh, really looking forward to the conversation. Um, 
I guess one thing that she and I share is that we're interested in America only, you know, in, in, in a, in a broad context. Um, I'm trained as a historian of modern Europe um, and, you know, I've principally engaged with American politics um, as a kind of more of as a kind of commentator and trying to think about, you know, comparisons and contrasts. Um, it's also true that, you know, I grew up in the Midwest in St. Louis, Missouri, a very racially divided city in the neoliberal era. And so like so many other Americans, the kinds of questions we're going to talk about, you know, are part of my upbringing and, and part of my political education. Um, but one, one, one thing I, I really want to say is, is kind of about the, you know, how, how we should think about um, the, the concept of identity or identity politics in these conversations. I for sure have long been interested professionally in liberalism and the history of liberalism, not just in this country, but globally and its relation to democracy. Um, and I've been writing lately and lecturing about Cold War liberalism. I think the last Zoom that we were all part of was on that topic. But when, when, I, when I hear the term identity, it, what's interesting to me is first its kind of intellectual trajectory across time and how it's kind of been articulated and owned by some people who think they oppose it. Now, it's not totally true that um, there haven't been those who articulate and uh, and advocate a kind of notion of identity politics. That phrase is there in the Combahee River Collective statement. But in in recent debates, um, it's kind of been a swear term or phrase for those liberals and even leftists who favor either a class or national privilege to the kind of framing of progress that they endorse against some alleged set of enemies. So I, I, you know, I personally have intersected identity as opposed to liberalism and democracy, mainly as someone watching people attack it uh, and wondering how we should respond to those attacks. Mm -hmm. um, because I think they're very misleading. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you both for those um, more personal and, and uh, really interesting um, kind of background, sharing of your background with us. So diving right in and, and picking up uh, where Sam left off, Juliet and Sam, you each bring um, a nuanced approach to what's characterized in American public discourse as the debate over identity politics. In fact, in different ways, you each critique the critics of identity politics. And in doing so, um, you help to highlight the lights of limits of contemporary liberalism in relation to American democracy. So I'd like to start by asking you or, or to elaborate or to continue elaborating um, your views on this theme. In your opinion, what's right and what's wrong with so-called identity politics in the US context. And more generally, how do you see the relationship between collective identity, liberalism and democracy in today's America? Sam, let's begin with you. Your views are perhaps most clearly articulated um, in your critique of Mark Lilla's popular 2018 book, The Once and Future Liberal After Identity Politics. Absolutely. So again, as I said, and, and as you're hinting, you know, I've engaged this concept and this conversation really kind of bemused by some others who have placed identity at the center of, of their understanding of what's gone wrong with liberals, liberalism and with liberal democracy. Uh, and of course, at at, at the head of the pack of that list has to be Mark Lilla, former colleague, uh, well-known public intellectual, who just within a day or two of Donald Trump's election in 2016, published an op-ed in the New York Times. 
uh, called the end of identity liberalism. And it, it was, the, I believe, one of the most read op-eds in the history of the newspaper. And he then capitalized on this success uh, of, of uh, at least, you know, reception to uh, write a, a book basically arguing that there had been a better liberalism that was unifying. Um, and it's not like that argument had never been made. Um, often it was made in terms of kind of a nationally unifying liberalism that didn't focus on the plight of any particular, you know, people or group. Um, Richard Rorty, University of Virginia professor for a while there, made a very similar kind of complaint earlier. And he was retroactively credited, um, among others, for um, you know, anticipating Trump selection. Since the argument, as, as far as I can tell in, in their thinking, is that to the extent you focus on the particular subordination of groups what on the basis of gender or race, among other criteria, you alienate a potential coalitional majority that you need to shape. So uh, it's not like these gentlemen denied that there, there, there were groups, Blacks and women, among others in this country, most, you know, graphically, who were subordinated more regularly and more profoundly than others. Um, but they thought that framing a liberalism that emphasized these facts was self-defeating because there had to be a national story. Now, it's interesting, on the left, some argue not in terms of nation, but in terms of class, that actually, if you ha take up a class framework, you identify um, not just the subordination of, of Blacks and women who are you know, more likely to be subordinated on, on a class basis too, but you include others. For example, the white male working class, the kind of famous phrase uh, of, of these analyses. And I, you know, I, I basically think that th this is this these these um, arguments are are generally presenting a false choice. Um, and indeed, you know, one of the you know points of an intersectional analysis was to allow us both to recognize the the special features of subordination that you know might track gender race uh disability indigeneity sexual orientation while also integrating those facts in a, 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 as general a picture as we need of subordination in general including class subordination and what I wrote that piece um, about Mark Lilla mainly to query his historical account, because what he basically says is things were going fine for liberals until the Combahee River Collective and, you know, the rise of feminism uh, and so forth, which ruined everything. I mean, that's basically, you know, it's a bit unfair, but that's basically what he argued. And that doesn't seem to me correct. Um, first, it idealizes prior liberalism, which we know through so many studies, what was definitely class oriented, at least up to a point in the New Deal, but privileged white males to the exclusion of African Americans and women, uh, the first group being kind of completely left out of a lot of New Deal programs, or the GI Bill, so forth and so on where women were kind of incorporated in the New Deal through the mid-century family wage, basically emancipated through their men, their husbands. Um, and so if, if we don't recognize, you know, the limits of that liberalism for which so many 
Lil O'Rourke, et cetera, are nostalgic. We, we, we don't, we haven't even accepted that there can be special subordination or particular subordination. And then just to be very brief, the, the idea that liberalism went wrong because it began to recognize, you know, diversity. Um, and it, it seems to me extremely oversimplified. Um, and it, 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 there, 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 in fairness, there is, you know, an intricate discussion to have about the Democrats coalition in the United States and its partial self-destruction in and through a turn to African-American, you know, civil rights and, and feminism. But, you know, the, the response to that history, I think, is to create a new coalition that is a working class coalition that is not about erasing the special, you know, fate and features of the different constituents of the working class. Um, so that that's my that's how my my general argument um, about about Mark Lilla, and I guess I you know I I you know I, I would just generalize it by saying we 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 don't need to choose between um, class and other forms of subordination and forging a political project for America or anywhere else. Julia, as, as um, Sam was just discussing, one of the most widely articulated critiques of identity politics is that its preoccupation with difference compromises the solidarity that's needed for a liberal democracy to function in a diverse, multiracial and, and multicultural society. Of course, political solidarity, and in particular, the ways in which the politics of solidarity remain deeply racialized is one of the central concerns of your work. As you put it, political solidarity is supposed to transcend race, yet solidarity continues to be powerfully delimited by race. What's your take on the so-called identity politics of American society? And what are the implications of your work for this relationship between collective identity, liberalism, and democracy? So I think one of the things that I, I would say in response to this is that the first thing that we have to realize is that everyone has identity politics, right? And, and the problem is that this framing of its, its identity politics versus other more universal concerns, as, as Sam put it, what it does is it obscures certain kinds of identity politics that are functioning through this um, comparison, this false um, opposition that's being framed. So it's not just marginalized groups that have identity politics, but we don't recognize the identity politics of dominant groups is the problem, right? Um, so I wanted to, to talk about this by, and I think um, it's, absolutely right that we need to also um, think about the fact that this is something that, you know, a number of thinkers have recognized and pointed to prior to this moment, right? So in an essay written in 1940 called The White World, W.B. Du Bois described the views of this imaginary white friend um, who he said is socially liberal, educated, and until the age of 30, quote, had not known that he was a white man, or at least he had not realized it. But lately he had come to realize that his whiteness was fraught with tremendous responsibilities. It would seem that colored folks were a threat to the world. They were going to overthrow white folk by sheer weight of numbers, destroy their homes and marry their daughters, end quote. So part of what Du Bois I think is pointing to you know, really eloquently in 1940 is this idea, right, that um, that people are just as enmeshed in these notions of who they are, but they don't necessarily recognize that, right? If this is what we mean by identity politics, right? Um, and that for particularly dominant groups, right, such as, um, you know, whites in the United States, they're just as enmeshed and committed to identity politics as non-whites, um, but this, but they think, but they don't see it, 
right? This is what he means by he had only come to recognize until recently that he was white. So I think part of what we have to do when we have this discussion is to recognize that the, the designation of something as identity politics functions at this moment as a way to delegitimize the rights or justice claims of certain groups, right? So it functions to make them seem as if they are self-interested or partial versus these so-called more universal um, orientations. And I think that the, um, in terms of the, you know, the debate in particular about the, um, the Democratic Party and its coalition, I think here, this is, um, you know, this is a, an interesting question that is one that is both about tactics, but also about, um, you know, thinking about what the party is willing to stand for, right? So part of the, the issue is, okay, assuming that you grant this critique, oh, it's, you know, as, as Sam said, what is the, what is the, um, you know, that identity politics, which are, you know, which um, we're attributing to feminists and to people of color, right? What is the response to this? Is the response, for example, in the case of we just saw the leaked pot decision by the Supreme Court coming down the pike that's going to, um, you know, overturn Roe, is it that we abandon women's rights, right? I mean, like, I think there is a way in which we have to think about what exactly this critique is, is suggesting politically, right? Um, and that there is a, a kind of, a, 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 you know, a question of strategy and, and of messaging and all those kinds of questions, but there's also a question about whether there are, does this mean that what we're saying is there can be no political party in the United States that stands for women's rights? Is that what we're saying? You know, so I think this is this is what I would say is is what we need to think about um, when we we approach these these debates about identity politics. Sam, I see you nodding. Did you want to chime in or add anything? No, I completely agree with every. I mean, everything that she that she said so so eloquently. I mean, I think it's only fair to say that you know, in an initial stage in these debates the phrase identity politics got coded by some of its advocates as, as, as a kind of ethical and political imperative or a mobilizational choice to stress this, this special plight of subordinated groups. And, and in, the, in the statement I mentioned from 1977, there's even a statement that, well, you, each group can only advocate for itself um, and not for the general interest, um, or there's a choice not to do so. And um, that that was, in a sense, you know, a, 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 a tactical choice, maybe a, a philosophical one, but it set up the, the later debate, because then people could say in response, well, no, what about the general interest or the more all embracing class or national interest? But when you when you make the point that that Julia does that everyone's got an identity and everyone's therefore um, maybe doing something universal, but always something particular at the same time. Then, then you 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 set the debate on a completely different plane. I'll also say that um, you know what what could emerge from a kind of fairer reckoning uh, it with, with in in you know, of the kind that, that Juliet's calling for is, of course, not an abandonment by the Democrats of, you know, gender and race, which would be, you know, absurd. Um, and their constituency wouldn't allow it. Um, but, you know, there, there are real tactical questions about what to emphasize in which election, in which state. Um, and, you know, I'm not defend. I'm not at all defending Lilla or Rorty or, or or people of that ilk. Um, and we'll get into how we can kind of imaginatively reconfigure some of the um, you know the the interests of our fellow citizens and not take them as set. Um, 
but the fact that they're not intractable doesn't mean they're easy to change. And there, there just are really hard questions about how you present a, an intellectual and political program in different parts of the country to win. Um, and those are real, um, which doesn't at all mean that we just demote or forget, uh, you know, the, 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 the worst off, um, you know, so, so, so I, I, I'm, I'm in, I'm in total agreement um, with those, you know, footnotes and provisos. I actually Go have ahead, some, yeah. yeah, I wanted to, to jump in here to say that I have a, a, a different reading of what the Kumbahi River Collective was doing in particular in their, in their statement. Um, I think part of when they say, right, that they stand for identity politics, we have to understand that this is in the context of their critiques of, um, you know, anti-racist movements at the time that they thought weren't paying attention to the, um, the sexism that black women faced, and then also to the women's movement at the time, which wasn't paying sufficient attention to racism. So in saying that we stand for identity politics, part of what they're saying isn't that we reject these broader um, uh, concerns, but that we need to um, organize because these other movements refuse to take our um, our concerns seriously or make them central. And there is actually in the statement, there is a very, um, you know, they they have in in coining this idea of the simultaneity of oppression. One of the things that they say is that means that we have to struggle against racism, sexism, you know, capitalism simultaneously. So there is a way in which they're both calling for particular attention and saying we need to have this kind of broad base um, struggle against all these different forms of uh, oppression simultaneously. So I think that that it's it's really a caricature of that of where how people were using identity politics historically that has been mobilized in the contemporary debate. I'm sure we'll re return to some of these questions again. I want to delve now uh, a bit more deeply into the question of solidarity. As we've already discussed, the notion of solidarity is a key concern of your work, Juliet. It also plays an important role in some of your writing, Sam. I'm thinking, for instance, of your recent book, Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World. It seems clear that to effectively address injustice and inequality, we need a form of, of solidarity that is sufficiently thick and meaningful. In other words, a solidarity that entails not just a cognitive commitment to a set of principles or even um, a sense of empathy with others, but one that motivates us to act and to make uncomfortable sacrifices. One of the tensions uh, or challenges that we come up against, however, is the apparent inverse relationship between the thickness of solidarity and its reach. That is, its capacity to extend across lines of difference. What would it take from your perspective to resolve this tension? In other words, to arrive at a thick and motivating solidarity that does not become diluted as it extends toward the universal. Sam, I'll go to you first. I was struck uh, by a passage in your book, Not Enough, where you write, human rights have become our language for indicating that our cosmopolitan aspirations are strong, not stopping at the borders of our particular nation. But they have also become our language for indicating that it is enough, at least to start, for our solidarity with our fellow human beings to remain cheap and weak. Sam? So you're posing an incredibly difficult question, um, in part because, you know, for my version of it gets it less at kind of the American scene than the kind of global one. Um, the argument I was, you know, making about human rights in that book is basically that um, they 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 do expand the let's say the the space of you know human solidarity and you know implicate and make us conscious of really far-flung obligations ones that people might not have found intelligible before 
but they tend to contrast pretty starkly with the expensive obligations that were local and more restricted, but that people actually shouldered. And so I was wrestling in that book with what to say about the fact that this expansion of solidarity in the age of human rights is also the neoliberal era when welfare states are getting hollowed out and you know taxes are falling uh tax tax rates especially on the wealthy and so forth so you know you you again you know just to leave that example behind can understand that um at at, at least as as a default um if you assume a, a, a kind of space of of solidarity you know that 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 may already exist in some early form you can then press people to take it seriously including by opening their pocketbooks um, but if you then in it also demand that they expand their horizons which could equally happen you know at the national level uh, if you have a, a welfare state uh, that it involves high taxes and at least some, you know, egalitarian concern, but doesn't make room for African Americans, uh, isn't focused on the plight of of women, except in so far as their wives of auto workers or whatever. You you're 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 placing a demand on people, and they can refuse it. And indeed, there are some theories of neoliberalism that say that one factor in its rise is basically that new demands were made on people to expand those there they would include in the in in their space of of you know compassion and and identification and solidarity. Um, this happened not just in the United States, but in in Europe with changing demographic patterns. And again, some theorists have said, you know, the rise of immigration politics led people to, you know, want their states to do less and, and take less of their money for the sake of other people. Um, and I, I've argued that insofar as that is a, is a real dynamic, we should take it seriously, but not treat it as written in the stars. Some people have argued that, you know, if we take it seriously, what that involves is basically conceding that people are unwilling to expand their horizons of solidarity to new kinds of people, whether people abroad or people who'd been excluded at home. And we should just kind of live with with it. Um, and, uh, you know, that argument leads to in some very scary directions, you know, because it suggests that if we want to have a robust welfare state, we should exclude immigrants or exclude immigrants from the protections that the welfare state's supposed to provide. In contrast to that view, I think, you know, solidarity is malleable. We'll get in later in the conversation to how, how it can be expanded. But it's not like we can just ignore the fact that people uh, need to have their horizons expanded and they're set in a certain place. They, you know, could be, they could contract, they could expand depending on material and imaginative factors. And for any reformer who thinks ultimately there ought to be a universal human solidarity that is about fairness beyond borders and not just within them, you, you have to take seriously that there are hurdles to overcome. So that's how, that's how I would think about this problem, but I'm really eager to hear how Juliet might think about it. In your 2009 book, Juliet, Race and the Politics of Solidarity, you grapple directly with the question of how to achieve meaningful political solidarity across racial and cultural lines, arguing that 
we need to find commonality in the radical difference of others. Could you tell us more about this dynamic interplay between commonality and difference in relation to solidarity and its implications for American society today? Sure. So, you know, one of the things that I, um, I argue against is the idea that solidarity or expand or expanding solidarity should be based on enlarging our view of who the we of solidarity is. Um, and, and this is a view that I think, um, you know, is fairly common, right? This idea that we start with these kind of, you know, um, small communities of care and concern and we sort of expand them out. Um, and, that, and that the way that expansion happens is that we, we learn to see people whom we thought of as different as being like us. And I think this is, this is fairly common in the way in which people think about um, how solidarity functions. And I actually think that this is the wrong way of thinking about the problem. And, and, and the reason that I think, about, I, I think this is because I think it presumes um, that solidarity is based on, on thinking that people are similar to us, that they are like us. And this is ultimately, I think, creating, of course, these huge problems because what happens to the people who are not like us? Right, whom we cannot see as being like us in some important way. So I think what we need to to, to try to think about is how do we um, how do we cultivate um, you know solidarity among strangers, right? How do we cultivate solidarity um, among um, people who are actually different from us? Um, and if we can only conceive of relations of obligation to those who are like us, that's actually a pretty thin ground for solidarity, right? Um, and, and it doesn't meet what I can, you know, my um, conception of political solidarity, right? Because in a political community, you are not going to have a completely homogeneous um, uh, community. There are always going to be people who are different from you in some way. So political solidarity in particular, I think, requires this kind of solidarity across difference. Um, and I think that that it's really important for us to recognize, recognize this and to think about um, what are the what are the ways in which we can think about it. And I think here for we can think about the basis for such solidarity. One of the things that I suggest is that instead of thinking about it as based on, on these ideas of, 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 of commonal, of, you know, of common identity, let's say, or common, um, you know, um, having features in common, that we think about being placed in relations that are structurally similar. What I mean by this is something like, you know, climate change is a good example of this, right? So I think we're rapidly being, um, being faced to confront the fact um, that there are issues that we have to deal with that um, cross national borders where what we do in a place that we might think of as distant and very different will have real impacts and effects on other people and vice versa. Or that there are things that are affecting us all that we simply can't control from within right? this this, um, this sense of, of, of the people who are like us. I think climate change is one of these. I think the pandemic has revealed this, even though we've continued to unfortunately not think about it globally. But I think there are all of these, you know, huge problems that we currently face that require us to think about solidarity, not in terms of, of you know, um, extending care and concern only to people who are like us, but thinking about the ways in which we are, we are facing, right? We are enmeshed in kind of relations of obligations because we, we face similar threats and challenges, right? Rising sea levels, you know, um, global pandemic, whatever the case may be. Go ahead, Sam, yeah. Well, no, so that was beautifully said. Um, and I just want to make sure I understand it because, you know, I, I kind of took the conventional view and, and I'm, I stand corrected in it. On the other hand, you know, in, in, as, as a retrospective view, as opposed to a prospective view, 
you imagine solidarity formed and creating, you know, on a continuum, more relations of likeness, notwithstanding difference. And so, you know, just hypothetically, when Bernie Sanders says he would like to see America more like Denmark with its redistributive politics, um, which we lack, well, then we need some story about how Denmark came to be uh, and has a political community with all kinds of empirical differences that supports or tolerates redistribution. And that's a story, you know, about imagined community and print capitalism or whatever that drove people down a continuum from, you know, disregard of one another's plights towards some greater likeness. Now, of course, in real life, there are different people with different potential interests until they've been imaginatively reshaped. But, you know, in, 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 in kind of political terms, they, they have been, you know, pushed into some new unit with, with its own boundaries. So Danes reject too many immigrants and so forth, notwithstanding whatever, you know, what, whatever they're willing to do for their fellow Danes. And to me, that's still a story um, about, you know, commonality and a circle um, and, you know, saying that it's, it's, it, it, we need a conception of solidarity that preserves difference doesn't kind of, kind of solve the problem that we need to theorize and enact how we get people, you know, from America to, into the, Danish situation, which is a, a situation, it seems to me, of more unity, of more solidarity that's based on the, the, the belief in some kind of commonality, at least on a continuum more than before. So are we disagreeing at all, or am I, am I just riffing on, on your insight, or? So... I guess I would say um, two things. I don't know that we're, I think we are disagreeing to a certain extent. And I think what we're disagreeing, so I think you're, you're focusing in some ways on the, the sort of historical mechanisms, right? By which you might get from one place to another. And I'm, I'm more focused on the sort of shape of the normative argument that we need to make that will help us think about solidarity differently. So I just think we're, we're, okay. we're thinking about different levels because I think, um, you know, I, I guess part of what I'm saying is that, that enlarging, right, you know, constantly enlarging our communities of care and concern um, gets us part of the way, but it doesn't get us fully there because they're always going to be people whom we see as very different. And so for me, we need to, it would be helpful if we could think about solidarity as not being based only on, I share this, um, this identity with someone else. And this is the basis upon which, or they, these people are like me. And so I can extend care and concern to them. And, um, and I think this is a high bar, but I think this is the bar that, you know, that um, democracy requires of us because we don't have homogeneous political communities. Um, so I think we're just, we're, we're approaching the, the question from two different um, entry points. No, I appreciate that. And I mean, ultimately, I think we would want to kind of, in a sense, ret reconcile the retrospective and the prospective. And again, even from the retrospective view about achieved solidarity, Denmark, whatever, um, it's still very homogeneous. Um, and they're not part, you know, they're not all part of the same group, except insofar as they imagine themselves 
as you know and and similar enough to justify this national project and the redistribution that comes along with it and you know then it took you know we could we could tell them actually you're still very different and you've achieved this in a sense as a myth um and the trouble is that there are these limits you know because it's just danish and it presupposes this great wealth that others don't have and you have immigrants whom you're rejecting and so forth there'd still be like a you know mm -hmm. a, a strategic question about like well would that convince them to accept more immigrants or would it convince them not to and and so there's 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 you know the the prospective argument um that you're making is it 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 it, it it's it's incredibly powerful to me <laughs> but i don't know if it, i don't know how how kind of you know how strategically successful it would be in any particular place and i'm sure there are great examples of like huge success uh and we'll get into you know how imagination can can bring us beyond any kind of set notion of um you know our identities whether you know in terms of gender or race so this is a nice segue into the next question <clears throat> which again is, is exploring this concept of solidarity, but uh, addressing a dimension of it that we haven't touched on as much yet, which is that of what some would call perfectionism or our collective socio-political pursuit and views of the good life. And so perfectionist thought holds a, an ambiguous position in contemporary liberal discourse. On the one hand, since the Cold War, the impulse, which has always been present in liberal thought, to see the pursuit politically of strong visions of the good life as inherently dangerous and perhaps even destructive. That impulse has been strengthened. So one manifestation of this impulse I see is in the pervasive, pervasiveness of what might be called a kind of negative politics or morality. That is the tendency to define ourselves not by the positive ideals that we collectively pursue in solidarity with others, but rather by the specific political parties, elected officials, laws, actions, social structures, et cetera, that we stand against. So another significant expression of, of this kind of suspicion or sort of, you know, um, moving away from, from per, uh, perfectionist thought can be found in the, the ease with which a lot of liberal thinkers proclaim the impossibility of people ever reaching any meaningful consensus about the contents of the good life. But still, if one looks more deeply at the real history of liberal thought and of liberal societies, democratic societies, and both of you has done in your own work, it seems to me hard to ignore the role that robust, positive conceptions of the good life, whether religious or philosophical, have played in bringing together diverse groups of people to pursue the political ideals, build the institutions, undertake the cultural renovations that we rightfully hold dear in liberal societies. So I want to ask you both to speak more about the role that positive notions of the good life can play in helping us to navigate the crises of identity um, and belonging that we find ourselves facing today. Should we be trying to build some kind of consensus on the elements of the good life? And if so, how might we go about doing it? What role might scholars such as yourselves play in this process? What about other factors and forces, religion, the arts, new forms of deliberation and debate? Um, so Juliet, let's, let's begin with you. So this is a difficult question for me um, because I tend to think that, um, I tend to focus when we talk about, you know, building consensus around ideas of, of, of the good life is, I, I tend to focus on when we look at, at how that has um, played out historically on the people who have been um, expected to make sacrifices to make such consensus possible, right? So, so part of, I think, my, my worry about thinking about um, the task uh, in this way is that, um, is, is that, again, it, there is a sense in which, you know, I think there is, there is a level of disagreement that is unavoidable. And how do we find ways for people to come together despite those disagreements? And, and, and I get the, you know, I get the, 
the appeal of saying, well, maybe we can build this kind of consensus. And I think a lot of liberal political, you know, philosophers, um, for example, someone like Rawls, their answer has been to say, well, we're not going to get, con- you know, consensus on the good life. They're always going to be um, different uh, conceptions of the good life. So what we need to agree on is the, the framework for working out disagreements, right? We need to to, to focus on procedures. And there's also been, you know, I think important and, and, and well-founded critiques of, of this kind of procedural liberalism, right? That focuses on, 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 the, um, on the mechanisms for deliberation, let's say, um, rather than on the outcomes. And I think that what I, you know, what I would say is that, um, We find ourselves in a moment where I'm not sure that the problem is that we lack consensus on on the good life so much as like we're we're lacking some consensus on some even more basic things, which are like the right to have rights and equal dignity. Um, Frankly, the the idea that democracy is is something that um, that we should be invested in even when we are not on the winning side. So, so I guess I would say, and I, I don't think this is a problem just in the US, I think we're seeing these threats actually in many parts of the, of the globe right now. So I guess part of what I would, I would wanna say is, I think, um, I think trying to get us to have you know, I think what we need to do is to is to instead of saying, can we get consensus on the good life is to actually um, focus on on how do we get consensus, frankly, on on the on things like do we want to live in a democratic society? Do we think everybody deserves equal rights? I think we're, we're actually at that point right now. And and I don't know that the that, you know, I may be wrong. Sam may disagree with me that that focusing on, on, on a shared notion of the good life is going to help us get to where we need to go at this moment. Thanks, Juliet. Sam, what would be your take on, on these questions? I agree with Juliet that this is a really hard one. Uh, and so just for the sake of devil's advocacy, I will disagree. Uh, 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 and, and let me just float a couple of possibilities. Um, first, kind of recapitulates the like the the difference between the retrospective uh his, realist historian and the you know prospective utopian theorist uh and it and the argument goes like this any real society will have a tilt it will be committed not to neutrality but to some hegemonic vision of the way we ought to live as individuals and groups. And if that's true, the question is not whether there's a hegemonic commitment to the good, some, you know, conception of the good life, but what it is. And I think in our society, it, it is a, a kind of more or less, you know, transactional vision of, you know, what we're supposed to do as humans. And, you know, it has to do with self-advancement and meritocracy. And, and we get very angry in part for that reason, when we look out and we see that gr- gr- people who are part of groups that have been historically excluded still are, uh, because it, it's a deviation from the perfect competitive meritocracy that is, is actually our, you know, collective ideal in many spaces. Um, so that's a first argument. Um, and if, if it's right, then maybe we should, you know, consider the, the original liberal perfectionism, which, you know, was very common in the 19th century, when it you look at figures like John Stuart Mill and uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, the people John Rawls attacks as comprehensive liberals, um, because they said, you know, free self-creation, and I think they 
you know, included groups, not just individuals as the subjects of that. Um, it ought to be the highest life for modern people. Okay, you know, we don't want to get into that. Um, where I think it connects to this discussion is that the original liberals cared about what you make yourself, including at the group level. And one, one worry about so-called identity politics, I think not a very common one in the debates, but one that I would stress is that we, we don't want to entrench old identities, but create new ones. That's the central liberal aspiration. And, you know, there could be a risk that, that just thinking of liberalism as getting groups to coexist effectively entrenches, you know, extant group identities rather than lets us form new groups. Now, the second argument is going to be a little edgier and more speculative, and it basically goes like this. You can't get people to defend procedures unless they see some stake in it that's bigger than the procedures. And that will effectively, and I think in principle, implicate, you know, what's, what's the reason for the procedures? What am I getting out of democracy? What's my reason to believe in it and embrace it and practice it? And it can't just be, well, you know, the rules say this. So I, I, I would argue that maybe like if we aim too low, we lose the game and we have to aim higher to save even the most basic, you know, procedures we, you know, are so concerned about these days. But I can't prove that. I, I just, you know, put it, put it out as a kind of counterpoint to Juliet's, I think, very worrisome point that well, we can't even defend democracy in its most minimal form today. And I'm, I'm wondering in response if maybe we have to go big in order to even keep the most basic things living for ourselves. Juliet, did you have any thoughts you wanted to share in response? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, I just wanted to say this. So one of the things that I'm thinking of is... Um, this, uh, and I agree with the idea that the procedures, you know, this is the critique of procedural liberalism, right? That procedures aren't going to motivate anyone and, 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 and also masked, um, you know, other problems. So, so I, it, so this isn't intended as a defense of that, but I'm thinking about, you know, a, a point that um, a, a, a colleague of mine made when we're talking about, um, you know, the very conceptions of, um, you know, what the good life is that underlies something like development and economics. And they were talking about in the context of, let's say, certain indigenous, rural indigenous and black communities and, and the idea that underlies many national and even international accounts of, let's say, um, you know, by, um, you know, um, things like the the World Bank or, um, or, you know, even, you know, anti-poverty programs, that it's this idea that the good life looks like a certain kind of material, you know, that it, it carries with it certain things. So, so you value certain kinds of, you know, some sort of arbitrary standard of what the material standard of living is and access to certain goods, as opposed to other kinds of things that a community might value that might be lost in, in the context of development. So I guess part of what I'm, what I worry about, and, and I, I, this isn't to, um, to suggest that, that Sam is wrong, but just to say, this is my worry, right? So when we pursue some notion of the good life, who gets left out of it? And how do we, how do we account for people who have different conceptions? That's, that's my worry. And I don't, I don't know that we have, a, we have an answer to that, but I think um, this is the, the tension, right, that liberals have been grappling with since forever. Well, so I, I, I think that's right. I just just a brief comment that, you know, the 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 ancient visions of the good life were very oppressive. Um, but any modern one that you'd want to forward would would build in some toleration because 
um, the whole point of it, of, you know, say individual creativity is difference. And so it would be false to somehow let your modern perfectionism, you know, end up as authoritarian and oppressive as all the old versions we know. But it's a very important, you know, cautionary point that Juliet's making. So to continue with the um, very difficult questions, I wanted to turn now to the topic of imagination and particularly the imagination of our collective future. So Juliet, in your latest book, you have a very stimulating discussion of how visions of a future society in which some of the worst scourges of racism were overcome played a role in orienting the thought of um, W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, the Mexican thinker and political figure, Jose Vasconcelos. So Sam, in a co-written 2021 article, you ask us to imagine what it would look like to live in an American society that had relinquished its veneration of the constitution and simply accepted that its peoples are involved in an ongoing deliberative process of deciding their most basic commitments. So I wanna ask both of you to speak more about the role that these kind of speculative excursions can play, not only in enriching our ideas about the society we want to build, but also in possibly disclosing new pathways for social action and transformation that might not have been visible before. So what kinds of imaginative explorations or visions of the future would you consider particularly relevant in helping us step beyond some of the crises of identity and belonging that we face in the world today, particularly in democratic liberal societies? Are there any particular narratives or thinkers or concepts or claims that you found especially useful in your own efforts to think further about our possible future? Um, so Juliet, we can begin with you. So this is a great question. Um, um, and I think this, this question about political imagination is central, right? Because um, this is the way that we, that we envision something different beyond the crises that we're in. And I think that um, political imagination um, is, is absolutely crucial for getting us past moments of impasse, even when we, you know, it's not that they're giving us a roadmap, but they're giving us something to strive for that allows us to, to work in the present rather than to give in to, to despair and to throw up our hands and say, there's nothing we can do. So I wanted to point to two um, social movements that I think have, um, have done important work that has um, shifted not only public discourse, but and done so by, I think, um, enlarging our contemporary political imaginations, um, not in ways that have never been done before, but in ways that maybe in some cases brought us back to some um, conceptions that, that in a prior era to this current neoliberal one, we might have embraced more fully. So I'm thinking about Occupy and, right, which is seen you know, I think as, as, as largely having failed. But I think when we think about, um, you know, Bernie Sanders' campaign, the, the, the ways in which we are now, you know, having um, at the national level discussions and, and debates about things like, you know, um, uh, child, you know, the um, child tax credits about support for, um, you know, um, various kinds of policies to help families that we are at a moment where that kind of critique of the kind of the, the you know, the 1%, the sort of growing um, economic inequality that seemed to fail and to sputter out, I think has really brought us back to being able to have a conception that the state has a role in providing care that we had really moved, um, moved away from. Right. If you think about the welfare state debates um, of the, the 80s and, and, and 90s. And I think we are back to having those arguments in a way that I think is, is, has been really um, important um, in terms of moving forward. Another social movement that I would point to is the movement for Black lives, you know, and, and there's, you know, speaking of the, the people who are often accused of identity politics, right? Um, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, um, I think criticism from, let's say, centrist Democrats about, you know, oh, you know, these defund the police slogans is really hurting us, um, uh, you know, in terms of our, our um, 
um, electoral prospects. But I think one of the things that that um, the the anti carceral um, approaches that that the movement has um, put forward. One of the things that I think it can really help us do and that it's really already sparking those conversations is to help us think about non-retributive approaches to redress or repair after crime, after injustice. And I think we see the, the problems with this. I think people are starting to see the problems with this, even if you don't agree with the critique of the police, even if you don't agree with, with the fund, but if you think about something that just happened, right? So um, the Louisiana bill that is being considered that would um, fetal personhood bill, right? That would criminalize any, um, you know, any, um, uh, um, um, you know, loss of a pregnancy, et cetera, right? I think one of the things that you're seeing is people are, in addition to, of course, for those who are pro-choice, um, critiquing the, um, you know, the, the sort of um, backsliding on, on, on abortion rights. There's also a critique of the move to criminalization, right? That this is always the, the place that people go. Uh, and so I think that these two movements are, are examples of the ways in which your political imagination can change. Even if at the national level, we're not getting Right, we're not getting rid of the police, and even if we can't imagine that, there's a there's a way in which we can shift the debate and help us to think about how do we think about some of these social problems in without thinking about right a kind of carceral or punishment mentality. Sam, what will be some of your thoughts on? Oh, that was a brilliant answer, and I'll I'll just answer in in a in a way that just kind of connects some of the early phases of the conversation to what Juliet just said. So, you know, one of the things that most infuriated me about um, the kind of you know critique of identity politics in Mark Lilla was his understanding that that in a sense interests are set. Um, so he, he tells a kind of parable about um, a fisherman uh, who goes out and like the Democratic Party has to, you know, uh, ca catch some fish, you know, who might, you know, not, not be willing to, to, you know, get caught, uh, might avoid doing so. And, and Lilla says, it's very odd that you would yell at the fish, uh, I, I, AKA the white men and criticize them for oppressing blacks and women as a strategy. Um, and you know, that his, his account of why the Democrats lose in certain places is that identity politics has led to that kind of strategy, which of course fails. And what I think the argument neglects and that the career of someone like Martin Luther King, you know, so amazingly illustrates is that interests aren't set, but can be imaginatively transformed. And we've, we've seen politicians who have the ability to change people's sense of what their interests are, uh, what groups they're part of, or what differences they must embrace, or at least tolerate as part of a common political project. Um, and if we think about the transformative role of the imagination that way, then the parable of catching fish is not the right one for politics uh, because it presumes that like, it's just purely strategic or there are these material interests and identities that are already you know, fixed and you can affect them through political persuasion and, and, and rhetoric uh, and vision. And I think, you know, I'm completely with Juliet about how specific movements can completely alter, you know, people's self-understanding of what their interests are. And here I'm, I'm switching away in a sense from the kind of more retrospective view to the more prospective view, since, you know, often people are tempted 
to say, well, ultimately, you know, visions follow from material interests and are credible because of material interests. But, you know, maybe that's true in certain cases when we go back and analyze, but I think we, we can't but live politics as, as, you know, a fund of possible futures that we should, you know, imaginatively inhabit and then enact. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to add to Juliet's examples of, of how, how you, in our time that's happened, but, you know, my own work has been, um, you know, f- about the, the power of nationalism imaginatively, which, you know, until people like Viktor Orban and Donald Trump gave it a bad name, uh, was, a lib- was invented by liberals and conquered the world in the 20th century because national identification provided an alternative to imperial domination and, you know, changed the world completely. Um, and then came the, these more cosmopolitan modes of thought that I've spent a lot of my career studying and looking at their dark sides, but only because I'm so impressed as anyone living in the 90s was with how people could be beckoned beyond, you know, boring accounts of the national self-interest uh, into thinking that there could you could have a more kind of globally imagined terrain for politics. And so these are just two more brief examples to add to Juliet's, but we, we completely agree about the, the kind of priority of imagination to you know, pol- political transformation. Mm-hmm. Well, we had a conversation um, the, in the last event in this series with uh, Barbara Fields and Derek Smith, in which we discussed the relationship of the current neoliberal economic order to race and to identity more broadly. And I'd like to ask you um, to speak about this relationship perhaps even more directly than you have already, whether it's to diagnose the source of say the widespread popular discontent we've recently witnessed in the United States or to find a remedy for the various social and economic injustices we face as a nation, disentangling economic factors from identity related ones has been particularly difficult, a particularly difficult and persistent challenge. Can these so-called material and non-material factors be disentangled from your perspective? In other words, how do you see the relationship of these factors to each other and to the current state of American democracy more broadly? Or perhaps to put the question um, a bit more provocatively, when you examine the crises of, of justice and democracy that confront us in the United States, what do you see as their fundamental sources? And what does your answer tell us about the solutions that we should be pursuing? Sam, perhaps you could start. All right. Well, I'll, I, I, I don't want to throw any bombs, but I mean, <laughs> I, 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 my trouble is, is maybe a little with the question, you know, that I, I think one of our problems lately has been seeking something that's allegedly fundamental Mm-hmm. compared to something else where I think our social experience is one of entanglement. Now, in I do think that, you know, analytically, you know, we have to disentangle things or treat them separately in order to try to make headway in understanding them. Politically, I think it's been very useful for certain people to, to engage in disentangling, um, you know, because people, if their advocates are, are defensibly selecting one cause to pursue rather than another, uh, and they can't wait on social theorists to kind of give them a complete picture, you know, if they want to com- complain about racial subjugation, how could we contest that? On the other hand, some of their opponents have also engaged in disentangling I mean, my, my, my own view is that, um, you know, we should engage in, in, in 
in in less privileging of any particular category, um, because our ex recent experience shows some of the political limitations of that of that kind of debate about, you know, is class most important, is race most important. Of course, we in the end can concede that, you know, these things can operate more or less independently. I mean, I remember vividly when uh, Trayvon Martin was killed and uh, Eric Holder gave a speech where he said, you know, I had to tell my own son to be careful in relation to the police. Uh, and someone like Cornell West, one of your prior guests responded, well, look, you know, white supremacy haunts the, the black upper and middle classes, but, you know, it's, it, if we just focus on Eric Holder's son and, and how he's treated, you know, um, as as a black person in America differently than white people, we this is West. We hide and conceal how vicious white supremacy is for the black lower classes. Um, now it's only fair to say Holder's son does have, you know, the plight of any black male in America, which is different than what my children, you know the social experience my children live. But West is also right that, you know, we we ultimately should focus on the way that race and class are so deeply entangled. Um, I think, you know, this kind of stance, you know, is is not that, you know, subtle, but I think we could take it much more seriously. I think in universities, we often live in a, a, a reform environment in which a kind of class-free reform is, 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 is privileged. You know, at a, at a place like Yale Law School where I teach, I sometimes worry that we're, we're seeing the diversification of the ruling class uh, as, as, as the priority social reform project. And not that it's wrong, but it's incomplete. So, I mean, one way to get beyond these debates about identity, uh, you know, in the forms that they've been prominent is, is really to just focus more on the entanglement of, of these subordinating factors, which is the rule, even if there are exceptions. Thanks, Sam. Juliet, should we be disentangling factors or, or do we need a different lens? Well, I totally agree that actually they are entangled. So, you know, so we have, if we are trying to disentangle, then we should figure out what that disentangling is doing um, or for what reason. Um, I think, you know, from a Black feminist perspective, right, the whole point of, of, of talking about intersectionality of oppression is to say you, you, you know, you can't disentanglement because people are living them in, um, in tandem, right, right. Um, but I also think here a comparative perspective is actually useful. So it's interesting to me to think about this race versus class debate, because in Latin America, there was a similar debate, but actually it was used for a long time to say when people would, would argue that there was racism in Latin America, the argument would be like, no, it's not race, it's class. So it's really interesting to be in this moment in the US um, now and seeing that debate, you know, take place in some senses, because I think, um, you know, part of the, the, um, you know, the, 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 the issue here is that, right, it's not just one or the other, but it's also to think about, you know, and, and the point about, you know, diversifying the, the ruling class, I think is, is well taken. But I also think there is, um, there is a way in which we need to think about both what it is that we are trying to do, but also what are the things that are driving, right, um, uh, opposition, let's say, to some of these, um, to, you know, to say having a more equitable society. And here I think, so in my own work, 
I make a distinction between material and symbolic loss. And I do it not because I think that they're not related, but because part of what I'm trying to think about is, you know, if you look at the Obama and the Trump eras, right, what you see is that, um, you know, the argument has been that, you know, white resentment has been driven by material losses, right? But what you see is that on the one hand, right, the, the, the political science, um, you know, empirical, um, you know, studies of this have shown that actually it's been racial resentment that has mostly driven, for example, support for Trump. Um, it hasn't been economic concerns. If you look at all the business owners and very wealthy professionals who participated in insurrection, they're not economically precarious, right? So then we have to think, and it's also the case that, you know, non-whites have also suffered material losses at the same time as the white working class has been suffering those losses. And they've suffered perhaps greater losses if you look at things like the impacts of the 2008 recession on non-white wealth or, um, the disparities and the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. So I think what we need to think about are the ways in which um, what's driving, um, you know, some of the the resentment and the rejection of these um, of, of thinking about how we might ameliorate some of the the disparities in our contemporary society is that people feel like their sense of those who feel like they were right, that they had a certain kind of priority, that that is eroding. And this isn't just happening in material realms, it's happening in symbolic realms. And this is what is, and so part of, of what you see is this sense of, of being displaced. And it's not just about material changes, right? So if you think about this in the context of, let's say, gender, Right. It's not that suddenly, right, women are, you know, ruling U.S. society, but there is for some, right, um, a sense of, of displacement that is happening for some men. And that is driving, you know, their, um, you know, move, you know, in cells and other right places like the manosphere, right, these 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 very misogynist um, 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 spaces. So I think we need to have a conversation that can make these distinctions because it'll help us understand what's driving people. But we also shouldn't take that to mean that there's some oppressions that are fundamental and they're real and there are others that are um, somehow not as, as, as real, right? So, so to, to go back to something like, right, um, you know, a, a, a central text for national, studies of nationalism, Bennett Anderson's notion of, of, of nations as imagined communities, just because something is imagined doesn't mean it's not real. So I, I don't know if, if uh, Sam, you wanted to, to comment on that anymore. Um, we do have a few minutes left, so we could bring in a comment from the audience. Um, if if uh, you're done with this exchange or, or feel free to continue, Sam, if you wanted to. Well, I'll anything. just I'll say something brief. I mean, because I really agree completely with with everything that Juliet said. I mean, I'm you know, I don't want to scandalize anyone, but I'm I'm probably a bit more skeptical of, you know, the conclusions of political scientists about <laughs> social reality when we've just had a conversation about, you know, how refractory people's interests are even to themselves and the role of imagination and constructing those interests. And in fact, I'd prefer if political science just changed its name to not have the word science um, because what we have is contending studies and, you know, the idea that your regressions beat mine probably, you know, doesn't work because there's ideology and, in the investigators. What I, I guess I would say the only, you know, thing I would maybe um, want to add is that may, the debate about class and Trump, uh, of course, shouldn't um, be about, you know, um, precarity, because the worst off didn't vote for Trump. And he had a cross class basis of support, just like mm -hmm. a Clinton and later Biden. Um, and indeed, you know, 
Trump expanded his electoral support, including in minority groups the second time around, in spite of the you know, biggest campaign of delegitimation against any political figure in my lifetime. But where I would stress class is not so much in terms of precarity as that, you know, Americans, including a lot of women who voted for Trump, have experienced a class reality in which they expect a, a worse life for their children rather than the better one. Uh, and that's due to massive kind of transformations in political economy on a global scale. And I think in that situation where it doesn't seem like the pie is growing and that, you know, you, your children will get a bigger slice of it than you will, there can be, you know, Manichaean mm -hmm. consequences. And, you know, so, so I would, and again, that gets us right back into the topic of like imaginative futures and what people anticipate not just for themselves, but for their loved ones. And so maybe there's a better economic argument to make, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in, 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 that, in that way. But of course it wouldn't change the fact as both Juliet and I agree that um, we're, we're dealing with intersectionality yeah. um, and not some privileged, you know, criterion or factor that explains everything. Well, Sam, as a, as a recovering political scientist, I would, I would tend to agree with you. Um, we just have a few minutes left, but I think we would hate to waste any of the time we have with you. So I'll read one of the comments we got after Ben's question about perfectionism, and then perhaps, Juliet, you could answer. It's directed to you, um, but certainly, Sam, you could chime in as well. It says, Juliet's point about non-material dimensions of a good society might point to a way of overcoming a dichotomy between procedure and substance. I was wondering if you have um, any thoughts about that or anything you'd like to, to contribute, either of you, uh, before we wrap up. So, um, I mean, I, I don't know that I, I, have, it's, I, I have any thoughts about, um, about how this might relate to the, the 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 debate about proceduralism, except to say that I think it speaks to, you know, to uh, and and this goes back to to Sam's point as well. I think that in general we need to to we need to make be able to make conceptual distinctions, but we also I think need to be able to to think about things in a in a more complex way, right? So so part of the issue isn't it's not just procedures or just right having a larger vision and it's not just um you know race or class because for example to sam's point about everybody is 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 seeing a future in which their prospects are diminished i would add yes but they're blaming the wrong people for that so even that that um you know i think i think this just points to the fact that we need to um, to be able to, to have these conversations in a way in which we're not engaged in the sort of dichotomous binaries. Thank you. And Sam, the, the last word, a brief last word goes to you. No, well, just first of all, thanks to Juliet and, 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 and you two. And I mean, I, I tend to think you can imaginatively invest in procedures and like a lot of people in the law do. So, and which, you know, it angers me at some time, but you have to recognize that for some people, procedures are imaginatively central. But I think for a broader American and global project, we need substance. And, you know, it gets back to Ben's, you know, fair question about whether we've deprivileged some vision of the future for uh, ourselves that would transcend just getting along in spite of our, you know, solidarity across difference. Well, we wanted to just thank both of you very much for joining us today. I mean, I'm sure I speak for all of us as an extremely stimulating conversation. Um, so yeah, Sam and Julia, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you us. so much. Such a, such a rich and insightful conversation. Thanks for making the time. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. So we also, just before we close, wanted to thank again our sponsors, the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University, and the Center on Modernity and Transition. And of course, thanks to everyone who joins us, uh, joined us today and who will watch the video recording in the future. 
Um, we hope you'll join us again on Thursday, May 26 at 3 p.m. Eastern, when we'll have the great pleasure of welcoming Glenn Coulthard and Arturo Escobar to discuss beyond recognition, self, other, and the making of colonial context. So Sam, Julia, thanks again. Thank you. See you all then. Bye.